RFK Jr.'s proposal to back the dollar with Bitcoin and end capital gain taxes on Bitcoin. Um, you know, this proposal had received some backlash. Some people think it's a good idea. Some people think it's a bad idea. Um, you know, I think some of the criticisms around it were the fact that, you know, you can't actually back the U.S. dollar with Bitcoin one to one. Um, I think that's pretty obvious to everybody, but. You know, I, I don't think that's really the intent here. Um, I think what's, what's more the intent is to lay the groundwork for a parallel system that will arise when the current system either falters or fails completely. Um, and so in order to sort of root this argument in you know, a solid foundation, I need to go back to the U.S. debt clock, you know, which I've visited many times if you guys watch my previous videos. Uh, you've seen me go here before, um, but it is it is fundamental to a lot of my views on the market and just broadly uh, driving my bullishness in Bitcoin and as a corollary, excuse me, as a corollary in gold as well. Um, now you've got U.S. national debt at 32.6 trillion. If you add the unfunded liabilities down here, the, the real debt is over 200 trillion, pushing 250 trillion. So, you know, this is, these are debts that will never be repaid in real terms. Um, so, you know, it, it, it is by definition a Ponzi scheme. And because it's a Ponzi scheme, it will eventually collapse, right? Uh, we know that for certain the Ponzi schemes always collapse. Uh, we just don't know when or necessarily how. Um, but it's you know it's a law of nature. If you if you have Ponzi scheme, it will collapse. Um, and I think a lot of people are in denial about that possibility or that reality um, because you know they just ha sort of have there's this notion that any problem in the world can be solved by raising more debt, and that's how we've solved our problem. You know. You know. Our, our recent problems in the last few years and it hasn't collapsed yet therefore it won't collapse in the future well if you have a ponzi scheme and more time goes on it's actually more likely to collapse because the more time that passes the more unstable it gets especially as the debt is growing exponentially you know it's sort of like a game of jenga if you're playing jenga and you know the, the more you play and the longer the time goes on the more unstable the Jenga tower gets with, as you p pull each piece and put it on top. Um, I think the analogy is ap applicable here. And so, you know, we, we sort of have this idea that, yeah, if you, you know, any problem that happens, government just raises more debt, there's more money instantly available. We use that, you know, if, you, if there's a natural disaster in some city, um, government just raises more debt, uses that debt to to you know pay whatever needs to be repaired <coughs> excuse me repaired and problem solved well you know there will be a point in the future where uh bond investors are looking at america and saying oh, okay look this is a ponzi scheme you guys are never going to repay your debt uh, we're never going to get paid back in real terms therefore we're not going to give you our capital and i'm not saying that there won't be like there won't be anybody in the world willing to lend to the U.S. government. What I'm saying is that the the demand for that debt will drop dramatically over time. I'm talking over a 10-year period, and you know, at some point, I, yeah, I personally, I think in like the next decade, like in the 2030s, um, you know, you'll you'll get into a scenario where the amount of people who are willing to buy bonds and lend to the U.S. government is just is not zero, but it's so low that relative to the amount of debt that they need to raise, it, it might as well be zero. Uh, I, I guess that's my point. So, you know, if, if the U.S. government can't raise debt on the, on the open capital markets, it, it can't really have the federal government, or excuse me, the Federal Reserve finance all of it, right? That just is monetization of the debt. And that leads to rampant inflation, and then that reduces demand for bonds, right? The more inflation you have, the less demand there is for bonds. So it's like a, a vicious cycle that is inescapable, and again, is 
almost a predetermined outcome that's inevitable. I mean, there's short of massive, massive energy innovation, like nuclear fusion, something that radically increases GDP, you know, by multiples of like 20 or 30. It's just, you know, you, it would have to be something earth shattering that, that, uh, resulted, you know, sort of pulled the air out of the debt bubble. Uh, but barring anything like that, you know, the current system will eventually come to a head um, in the not so distant future. And I say not so distant because it's, you know, it may be 10 years out, but it's also not so far away that, you know, we won't experience in our lifetime. And I think one thing that's important for people to kind of embrace within their mental models is the idea that like this is actually a very real possibility and you know it, it doesn't do any good to be in a state of denial about it and to pretend like it's not happening or that it won't happen you know if we just look back in history we know that there you know these types of things um, these monetary issues have happened before in a lot of countries when they start to get reckless in their um, the way that the government issues debt but even beyond that you know you have major wars that break out major things that affect people's lives negatively and you know to just be in a state of denial about it uh, doesn't do you or your family any good um, you know if, just to use a, a very severe example admittedly if you had knowledge of the Russia Ukraine war you know um, there were probably some people who were privy to that knowledge before the war broke out. And, you know, there are different groups of people who could do different or probably did different things with that information. You know, you have one group group of people who probably, uh, you know, may have been in denial. They, they may have said, you know, it's a very low probability scenario. I don't think it's going to happen. Therefore, I'm not going to worry about it. Another group of people who says, you know what, I think it's a significant possibility I'm going to, you know, protect my family and leave the country. Uh, one person did something with that information um, that benefited their life, and the other didn't, right? And the difference was the state of denial. Now, the collapse of the U.S. Uh, debt market and Ponzi scheme is a mathematical certainty and far more certain than, a, you know, the outbreak of a war, for example, uh, which is you know, probably in those initial stages, still a low probability event. So long way of saying that, you know, this is something this because of the scale of what's happening, it will inevitably take a long amount of time. But the debt behind the Ponzi is mathematically guaranteed to lead to exponential higher rates of debt issuance. And then at some point, uh, you know, just a total breakdown in those capital markets. So I think it's, it's a great thing that, you know, RFK Jr. is talking about, not necessarily talking about this issue in what he's saying here, but building the ground or laying the groundwork and building adoption for the parallel systems that would naturally arise, you know, in that type of environment where the current system is breaking down and the order is sort of you're starting to see the breaks at the seams um, because you know yeah while the you know the u.s government losing that ability to raise unlimited debt um, would be very catastrophic it's not the end of the world and, and life will go on and you know there will be alternate systems that arise in its absence and personally, I do believe that the Bitcoin is uh, is that parallel system. Now, of course, there'll be others, but I think it's the most important. And it's, mo you know, obviously you want to spend the most amount of energy focusing on the most important alternative system. Um, so, again, while, you know, while Bitcoin is never going to be backed one to one with the dollar because the dollar will never stop increasing in supply, right? The 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 debt, more and more exponential debt needs to be issued to, you know, pay for all the services that the government needs to pay for to service the existing debt. The supply of dollars is going to increase until 
you know, eventually you have the type of market disruption I'm talking about, at which point, you know, the U.S. government holding a significant amount of Bitcoin gives it an opportunity to pivot uh, from that scenario into a scenario where there's not a complete social breakdown and, and collapse in society and that they can actually do something meaningful <clears throat> and help their citizens rather than, you know, have like a total collapse of government and, you know, some type of totalitarian nightmare like you had in, in Germany a- after World War I. Uh, you know, that's sort of the scale and magnitude and the importance of what's being done here. Um, because again, it, you know, you don't have to redo that whole scenario in history where you have hyperinflation and you have people who are destitute, cut off from government services, and really, you know, just in an extreme state of desperation that we, we can't really um, fathom while we, have, while we still have the ability to issue endless debt. Um, you know, because that sort of funds our welfare services. You know, we can, you know, people may have criticism of it in America, but in America, you know, if you lose your job, you can go out on employment. Um, if you lose your job, you know, you, you can still get health care. You know, there's all these supportive services that we sort of take for granted that are, you know, are only possible because we can raise debt. Um, and, you know, if, again, if, if, if that plays out and then, you know, the world moves towards a Bitcoin system, you know, it'll be, it'll be very different. It'll still be debt markets, but uh, it certainly won't be the same debt burden. Uh, in the sense that debt would be less advantageous in a Bitcoin system. Um, in the current debt-based system, you basically have a scenario where uh, people who are sophisticated and know how to use credit and leverage to their benefit can do it in a way that you know people who don't know how to do that and who aren't that sophisticated can't really compete with them. And part of the reason for that is, you know, they the way that the tax code is set up, you can, a lot of the ways that big players bypass their tax burden is by, you know, using credit and leverage in ways that don't necessarily expose them to delta risk, but just sort of um, expose them from the need to, to enter into taxable events. Um, but anyway, I'm sort of getting off on a tangent there. Um, you know, I do want to just focus on what RFK Jr. is saying here. And again, I, I think I think it's a great idea, at least a great start uh, of an idea, you know, to build out that, whether you call it a stockpile or a fund or a stash that the U.S. government has. Um, that, in my opinion, that's very important. I think it, it's more important than you know, building their oil reserves or, you know, building the military. It, 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 at the very least, they're hedging themselves against uh, the future, right? Because so long as, you know, they have the ability to raise debt, they don't really need to worry about Bitcoin. But the moment that they can't, that then their ability to acquire Bitcoin suddenly goes to zero. So, If you have a little bit of foresight and a little bit of, you know, ability to perceive the future, um, you know, that becomes a very good idea, at the very least as a hedge. Now, the other part of his uh, proposal that is, you know, I don't think I've mentioned, but is, is equally important is the, for adoption at least, is his proposal to end Bitcoin capital gain taxes. And... That's really a major uh, roadblock to adoption of Bitcoin as a as a money, broadly speaking, more than just an asset. You know, as I mentioned previously, if you are sophisticated with leverage, you can use it in a way where you can shield yourself from t- capital gains, and you can embrace Bitcoin as an asset, um, expecting it to appreciate in value, and you know the capital gains if you're a sophisticated player it's not as big of a deal but as far as like integrating bitcoin as a payment system 
there, the only way that's ever going to reach adoption is if the capital gain taxes is, is eliminated on Bitcoin because, you know, if you go, so if you take Bitcoin and go buy a coffee with it using the Lightning Network, that become that then becomes a capital a, a taxable event, right? So you, you the tax burden and just the reporting requirements to like keep track of every single payment for tax purposes and to calculate it's just so costly and burdensome that it's just this major hurdle for adoption and ultimately any money you, you that gets embraced in the broader economy it can't have a capital gains tax because it, it just needs to be be able to be freely exchanged um, so I think I do think it's very important. I think, you know, that's sort of, in my opinion, where the future is going and, and people will, you know, different jurisdictions will definitely be quicker to embrace that. But I think in the future, you know, you'll, you'll probably see a scenario where a lot of different jurisdictions are cutting uh, Bitcoin capital gain taxes as a way to encourage capital to flow into their jurisdiction and creating a little bit more of a, uh, favorable relationship with with that capital than there is uh, currently right now because you know the way Bitcoin operates is that it, it it's truly censorship resistant capital so it can flow across borders without in a way that is totally unprecedented that could never happen in the past so it creates a very different dynamic between that capital and the government or jurisdiction where it's re residing in because you know in the past you know governments could trap capital they may not necessarily be able to control it within their borders but they can certainly always you know uh prevent you from sending it across borders so like if you, for example if you're you know if you're unhappy with the uh the way you're being taxed in america um you know, you can, good luck, you know, if you're, if you're trying to wire your money out, outside of the country to uh, really any international country, like, good luck with that, right? You're, you're going to meet roadblocks, and if you were a large enough player for them to be concerned about that, they could freeze that transaction completely. Um, but anyway, I'm sort of getting off on a, on a separate tangent, and I'll, 